The DSC results are out, a time of the year where you would spot me around drenched in rain and sweat. I run a project that pushes Hong Kong youth, especially the ethnic minority, to further their studies. They say that I'm a community leader. Occasionally, I speak, write, and perform. I am mixed race, ethnic minority, but know for a fact that I am a Hong Konger. In a city where 92% is Chinese and 8% is non-Chinese, both groups have coexisted for more than 180 years, yet don't commingle. We were made to believe that there are differences beyond our skin, even though we all share one common denominator, the Hong Kong identity, card. Yet in 2021, as a multiracial, bilingual, and third culture kid, and I'm caught in between these two asymmetrical worlds, can the Chinese and non-Chinese ever see past the differences of their skin? Can we connect from a level of, a, of the soul ever? I would like to share with you a transformation from foreigner to Hong Konger, and also to explore the Hong Konger identity crisis through the eyes of a, of a new generation of locally born and bred bilingual ethnic minority. And I stand here today on this red dot to share a message of hope, how you, especially the aspiring educators at this university, how you can make Hong Kong great again by reconsidering who and what constitutes a native Hong Konger. As an unspoken rule, Hong Konger identity is defined by its Chinese majority, but don't we all have an ancestral hometown or tales of chasing the Hong Kong dream? Back then, when Hong Kong was ceded to the British in 1842, indigenous villagers and foreign immigrants were basically the only people here. Most of what we know of Hong Kong came after 1950s, post-World War II, and in the form of Cantonese merchants and a staggering one to two million undocumented immigrants who swam or crossed the border from China. They were granted permanent residency status under this policy in 1980. Their descendants became the majority and turned Cantonese, what was once a minority language, into the mother tongue of Hong Kong by the 60s. To me, the question of when did ethnic minorities ever came to Hong Kong is somewhat a chicken or the egg type of a philosophical question because we have always been here and arguably earlier than most locals. But at the end of the day, should it matter? Well, let me tell you this. In the face of the adversary during World War II, these categories didn't matter. Our ethnic minority forefathers defended and honorably died for Hong Kong side by side with their Chinese brothers and sisters. Names of the iconic ethnic minority predecessors are embellished on monuments and infrastructures for they too laid the foundations to a defining characteristics of a successful melting pot that we are today. I'm thankful to all the ethnic minorities who paved the way for us. And yet, despite all of that, can you imagine that this community still needs to fight to be recognized as Hong Konger, despite paying the price with sweat and blood? Within Hong Kong media and lingo, ethnic minority is reduced into certain ethnicities, the criteria, non-white, brown skin, and living underneath the poverty line. The white or the rich were the expats. This term also lacks the representation of black Hong Kongers. And with all this mess, I would rather this term ethnic minority remain, remain within the realms of academia and public policy. I prefer to say that I'm a native Hong Konger, but if must be specific, born in a multiracial family. My parents were hardworking immigrants. Their dreams inspired me a lot. They met here in 89, got married in 1990, and the rest is history. Interesting fact, I had used to identify as a foreigner. The thought of even calling myself a Hong Konger seemed like a joke. I was happy within my vibrant English-speaking social circles where I am immune from colorism and racial slurs. 
And when I had reached primary one, I was sent to a traditional ethnic minority designated school. The non-Chinese kids who went there were those that didn't go to international school. Back then, the English medium local schools weren't ready for us. I mean, would they ever be? They were perhaps too timid to upset the balance and status quo of an ethnically homogenous Hong Kong perfect world that constituted um, a commonly held worldview among generations of local Chinese. My parents, our parents, were complicit towards this. We were their guinea pigs of an uncertain future here. And I believe that systematic discrimination begins in racially segregated schools. And this is the kind of deeply ingrained social conditioning which blinds both the deniers of systematic racism and its victims. Language learning is also a big issue. All Hong Kong students learn one English curriculum but two Chinese curricular systems. A generalizing approach which has done more harm than good, in my opinion. And coincidentally, I was among first batch to have learned Chinese at grade one, failing every single dictation test and exam throughout primary two. And my dad, being the hustler he was, used to drag me around across our neighborhood with my Chinese homework at the former Litong Street, the legendary wedding card street in Wan Chai. My dad could speak Chinese, so he would sought help for me from nearby shopkeepers and security guards until I found refuge at a nearby herbal tea store where the ladies took turns to teach me. They often treated me with traditional teas and snacks. And it is here where I truly experienced the Hong Kong neighborhood, the Kai Fong spirit, which remained within me. And I still struggled after that until my TV stopped receiving English channel. I used to live in a Tong Lao, a classic Hong Kong style old building where TV reception relied on dangerously fiddling on a fishbone antenna at a rooftop edge. So I was forced to watch Cantonese dubbed anime and, English, uh, and Hong Kong uh, drama serials. And then one day, a supernatural moment occurred. In the middle of a Chinese exam in primary three, I felt a jolt of energy in my head. Suddenly, I realized I know Chinese. It was a miracle. By primary five, I had won best in Chinese, and most have never even mastered the language until this day. When people ask me how I did it, I had trouble telling them about becoming possessed by a Chinese spirit during an exam, and so I attributed it to watching Cantonese TV. Perhaps that was the real reason after all. And then by grade five, I became a Cantonese speaking performer, featured at community shows and garnering media interviews just for literally um, performing speaking Cantonese as a non-Chinese. And at 11 years old at the time, I felt like a circus freak show, but soon realized my role. And at grade six, my ambitious mom contemplated sending me to the nearby English medium boys secondary school, to which was met by my teacher's disapproval, citing language problems. They were right. I had been deeply entrenched within the pits of systematic racism under the disguise of affirmative action. Yet most jobs still required HKCE and HKDSE Chinese. So I ended up in an ethnic minority school again. But at this stage, Chinese was least of my problems. I became the GCA level Chinese exam record holder of my school. My reading ability had ripened with the books of Mr. Chan Wan Hoi on ghost stories and Hong Kong's history, where my love for Hong Kong grew with every page. Teenage life at an ethnic minority designated school was rock and roll. The local Chinese world was invisible to us. We didn't have a study culture. There was no one to look up to in the professional workforce except for those few non-Chinese who came back to teach. But we were the kings and queens of an alternative Hong Kong utopia. And then 
The HKCE exams came at Form 5. A bloody massacre. Three classrooms of more than 120 non-Chinese students down to only seven. I was one of the lucky seven. But as I sat at the school hall, looking at the entrance, I saw my friends. And I knew that the distance between us at that very moment was going to be the gap in our lives. And I was to be alone. The seven of us were merged together with local Chinese and um, new arrivals from the mainland in a trilingual experimental classroom setting. We were the minorities for the first time and attention skewed towards them. But promising to make a difference, I focused on other things instead. I went on to make controversially vulgar speeches that incited student power, organized a pageant on women's rights, founded an English school magazine that criticized school and social policies. I worked on uniting Chinese and non-Chinese schoolmates and have come to be known as best friend Michael. After graduation, ethnic minorities typically took up stereotypical labor jobs, such as becoming a construction worker, a security guard, or F&B worker at Lan Kwai Fong, following their parents' footsteps. Not necessarily bad. Others went to vocational schools that accepted substandard Chinese qualifications only to be trapped by classes taught in full Chinese. Some of the fewer went back to their um, home countries and came back to stereotypical jobs. Still, better than those in rehab, in gang, or in jail. Even fewer went to university, and none in my batch went to local universities directly. But I reject this intergenerational poverty cycle and lack of choice. I took a gamble, community college. In the first day of college, I was the elephant in the room, being among four non-Chinese in a class, a batch of nearly 100. I had prejudices towards the local Chinese, so did they towards us. But as conversations came to a soulful level, through shared life experiences, our hearts slowly changed. And I, I have met my true friends who remain with me till today. Eventually, community college was a proven success. I got an offer to study English at City U and Reflecting upon the hidden talents of the non-Chinese, the suicides of Hong Kong students, and the lack of diversity in Hong Kong's tertiary institutes, I embarked on a solo project I named Best Friends for Further Education Project. My mission was to bring the kids out of the streets and back into schools. I dream of ethnic minorities becoming future CEOs, lawyers, Doctors, nurses, civil servants, LegCo counselors, government officials, and so on. Yet, these weren't things that ethnic minorities ever talked about. So few of our teachers empowered us beyond becoming a teacher. But then, you know, I believe that if there was more ethnic representation in the media and in the workplace, I know that this can challenge perceptions. I must confess that I someday fancy seeing a kissing scene between a Hong Kong may, uh, Chinese main actor and a Hong Kong South Asian main actress on screen without it being considered too heavy flavored or weird. I envision of a Filipina for Miss Hong Kong that will make Hong Kong proud and for Filipino to no longer be a synonym to domestic work and ugly dark skin. Utilizing my best friend notoriety, I campaigned aggressively on social media and on the ground. In two years, I had successfully popularized community college to ethnic minorities. I ruthlessly negotiated for marginal cases and for the recognition of other language qualifications. Some program admissions became 50% non-Chinese, and I was part of an effort in opening a foundation diploma program that enabled 
hundreds of students every year a second chance into tertiary education, many of whom were ethnic minority. And with my faith, I have brought people down from the rooftop and up the graduation stage. By now, some of those that I've helped have attained their masters. The glass ceiling is being broken one person at a time. Yet, by that point, I still felt content about my foreigner identity until the umbrella movement came. Whether you were pro or anti-government, the love for Hong Kong was the main point. I then realized how important it was to identify as a Hong Konger. And I began voicing out for civic participation of ethnic minorities regardless of political views. And when I took my master's at College of Business at City U, I had studied about China and Chinese culture and was shocked to learn that, by definition, Chinese actually consisted of 56 ethnicities and its naturalized citizens. I felt like my life had been a lie. And as more ethnic minorities held Hong Kong passports, I began to explore a link between a Chinese identity and a Hong Kong ethnic minority. Maybe even the term non-Chinese is a deception. As of today, Hong Kong mainstream schools accept non-Chinese. I refer to them as the lost ethnic minorities. Many of them have blended in with regular Hong Kong youth. Ethnic minority schools exist, but slowly dying out. And I still perform. And with the Zubin Foundation, I raise my voice directly to the government. Recently, I saw um, a new curiosity with ethnic minorities being brought into the spotlight. I see hope. And I still do my education project. I said hi to a young South Asian man who seemed lost. This time he said to me, I'm sorry, do you speak Cantonese? Maybe we can all just be Hong Kong Chinese, but of different color. Am I right? Or am I too far ahead of time? Thank you.